aromatic, non-aromatic, anti-aromatic structures. Um, what we're going to move into is just looking at all the possible reactions that can come out of, well, benzene rings. So this slide summarizes everything. Uh, everything we need to learn within the next, hopefully, three lectures, maybe even two and a half. It right, has all the bits and pieces you need. So with that, let's move into the beginning of it, the largest section, the EAS, Electrophilic Aromatic Substitution. So let's take that name and break it down into some pieces. What kind of pieces can you give me? What does electrophilic mean to you? <coughs> an electrophile. So let's come up with a symbol for an electrophile. Okay. Don't quite accept that. Give me a little more information. E plus. E plus. Next part. Aromatic. What does that mean? A ring. A ring. Okay. A benzene ring. And then substitution. Okay. So it's a type of reaction. We're going to be predicting a product. I didn't space this out nicely, so I'm going to shift this around a little bit. Predicting a product. Uh, would we expect the ring to be the electrophile at the same time? Any ideas? No. Why not? Because it has pi bonds, sources of electrons. And an aromatic ring has pi bonds. And all of those pi bonds are sources of electrons. We would expect it to act as a nucleophile, not an electrophile. Okay. So at a first blush, we could compare it back to functional groups we've already seen. We could look at an alkene, and alkenes react as nucleophiles or bases. They do not react as electrophiles. Okay. So that would suggest that I now have all of the reagents to run a reaction. I have an electrophile, and I have my nucleophile for the benzene ring. To do the substitution, that E needs to sub substitute for something in that ring. Well, what's in that ring? Hydrogens. Hydrogens. What else? Carbons. Carbons. So we get two possible results that we could consider when looking at this. We could look at the substitution where we somehow exchange a hydrogen for our electrophile. Or we could look at the situation where I've ch exchanged a carbon for the electrophile. Which of those two do you think is more likely? Nice. Top one, why? Then super stable, so there's a big issue. The benzene ring itself is super stable. It does not make sense to remove a carbon from it. Any other I thought, thoughts? To get the electrophile to substitute for a hydrogen, how many bonds are we breaking? One. Okay, at least at this level. To get the electrophile to substitute for a carbon? A whole heck of a lot more than one. Okay, officially, we'd have to break four because there's that bond to a hydrogen. Okay. So we now have an overall idea of what an electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction looks like. <coughs> So the next question is, of course, going to become, how does it do this? And what is our mechanism? So let's clean that up so we can see it all again. We've got our electrophile. We have our ring. And we somehow produce our new ring with our electrophile attached. So, what are your thoughts? <clears throat> Interesting idea. Maybe the ring isn't active enough as it is, and we have to activate it further. Turns out we don't. We can have this outright react. We can speed it up by adding catalysts and play around with different things like that, but we don't even need to do that. We can get this to occur on its own. 
resonance. What is resonance going to do to the ability for electrons to now form between the electrophile and the ring? Resonance would prevent it. Resonance keeps it in the structure. We're trying to get it to go out of the structure. What's the change? You're substituting an electrophile. Okay. Where did the electrons come from to make the electrophile carbon bond in our product? It came from our aromatic structure. Why are you saying the pi bond? That's where the electrons are. Our electrons are located in the pi bond. Those also happen to be the highest energy ones. Yes, there is resonance that makes them stable, but Clearly, this reaction happens. We're now trying to come up with an explanation for how it happens. Okay. So we'll take electrons from the pi bond. Which pi bond? Doesn't matter because, now we can go to Sean. Resonance. resonance. All of those pi bonds resonate with each other, which means it does not matter which pi electrons I take. Okay. For the sake of this drawing, I'm going to take these electrons. And I'm going to show those go to the electrophile. What's the result? Carbocation. Where's the carbocation? Um, on one of the carbons. Uh, so I heard where the electrophile is attached? Oh, where the electrophile is not attached. Sorry. Why could it not be where the electrophile is? There's an implied hydrogen. Now what happens? The positive carbon needs electrons. Where do we get electrons from? In the hydrogen and the carbon. Sean. Resonance. Resonance. <laughs> We need to show that we're allowed to form this structure. We have destroyed what in the process of making this structure? How have we destroyed stability? Okay. Anything else? It is no longer a conjugated structure, meaning it's higher in energy, yes. Everybody on Wednesday doesn't have an excuse to everybody that missed it. <coughs> it is no longer aromatic. Okay, so it is very high in energy. We took a structure that was three bonds, three pi bonds, so we would have expected high in energy, made it two bonds, okay, but we've lost that continuous resonance. That structure is fairly high in energy. So I have to really show all the resonance structures so that I can say, yes, it's high in energy, but there's at least some type of resonance contribution that is allowing it to be stable enough to form. Okay. Those three structures are all given a very particular name in this reaction. And it has to do with the carbon where our electrophile is attached. special about the bonds that that carbon has? The purple carbon, which I know isn't easy to pick out, but it's the one where the electrophile is attached. Which means what types of bonds are available to it? Those are referred to as our sigma structures because one of our carbons is only a sigma bond capable. 
the other carbons can be, have pi bonds. Okay. So those sigma structures explain some of the stability of this, allowing it to even form, because we are jumping massively up in energy because of that loss of resonance. Okay. So now what happens? Okay. We're still very high in energy looking at those structures. I need to permanently stabilize the structure. To permanently stabilize it, what do I need? A what? I will take the electrons from that hydrogen and reform the pi bond. The result is, at least the way I would show it, I have H plus floating off on the side. What are things that might drive this reaction forward? Okay. A base, possibly, but what's the issue with adding a base? The base would likely act as a nucleophile and compete with the aromatic ring. And because the aromatic ring isn't a strong nucleophile from the outset, by putting in a base, that's going to then pretty much nullify its likelihood of reacting. I could try and throw in a super weak, bulky base, but then look where the hydrogen is located. In a relatively sterically hindered site, the bulky base isn't going to help us out much. Something needs to pull off that hydrogen. So we could add heat to help facilitate that, and something will pull it, anything remotely basic. But let's focus less on the strength of the base and more on something else. Strong what? What if we had a really strong electrophile? Okay. The reason this reaction goes forward is because our products are stable. Okay. H plus had better be more stable than the starting electrophile. If I throw in something incredibly reactive as an electrophile, that will help this reaction occur. What else could I do? We can make the electrophile more electrophilic. We could also... So trying to play a Le Chatelier game, we don't have to deal with that, okay? primarily because that first step is reversible, the second step is typically not. Okay? And that largely has to do with the electrophile versus hydrogen difference. If you want to speed up any reaction, you can change the electrophile or we could play with the catalyst and we'll talk about that, the other species. Nucleophile. Change the nucleophile. What do I want the nucleophile to be? How does it become more reactive? It needs to have more electrons in it. So if I can alter the electrophile to make it more positive, I could also potentially alter the nucleophile to make it more negative. Okay, so we're going to look at how we can change those different effects and how that will contribute to the overall reaction. The first chapter is primarily focused on the electrophile. What are the reagents allowing us to do one reaction? Which I think is 22, 23, 22. 23 is then what happens once we've put something on it. Okay, when we started this out, which hydrogen did we substitute? Did it matter? No, why not? They're all the same. They're all the same. If I now go through and change my structure and I say start with the electrophile attached, is it going to matter which hydrogen now? Yes. Okay. Because not all of those hydrogens are identical. So it's looking at those patterns and trying to recognize them and manipulate between them. Kind of makes sense? Okay. So if we wanted it prettier, there it is, nice and pretty. Okay. So speeding the reaction, looking at your electrophile. We want to make the electrophile more electrophilic. Take our positive and make it more positive. So we've got several electrophiles shown below. Which of those would you expect to be the most electrophilic? What do you think, Laura? The one with the positive sign is probably going to be the most electrophilic because it's positive. Can we get any more positive than positive. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. So that is probably our most electrophilic. So if we were going to rank these, we would say that's most is one. 
How about between the next two? <clears throat> Why the acyl chloride? We have a weak polar pi bond, which could do resonance, generating a partial positive charge. Okay, through a resonance contributor, that's probably the next. Bromine is now probably the least. Kind of make sense? So what we were addressing here is now how can we make the electrophile more electrophilic? Okay, so let's ignore the nitro because the nitro was already stupidly high. So we could look at the acyl chloride and we could look at the bromine. How could we possibly make either of those more positive? Okay, we would need a leaving group to leave. So in the case of the bromine, one of those bromines must take the electrons. Is that going to happen quickly and easily? No. Okay. So what we have here is now our electrophilic bromine out here. We would need something to cause that other bromine to take the electrons and leave. Okay. For it to take the electrons, it probably needs some place to dump those electrons. So what if I reacted the bromine with something first? What is a characteristic of that something? It has to be electron donating. Electron donating? If it was electron donating, it's going to compete with the aromatic ring. That becomes a problem. It needs to be an electron acceptor. It needs to help polarize that bromine bond by pulling the electrons out. It needs to become an electron acceptor. And what is a characteristic of our electron acceptors? Electron acceptors should be positive. Okay. There, an interesting thought. What did you just suggest? I just had HBr. I now have a strong acid. That strong acid generates H+. What does that H+, potentially do? Weaken the bromine-bromine bond, helping further polarize that. One of the catalysts we could add is an acid. Whoops, wrong eraser. Okay. As long as I have an acidic hydrogen, I'm doing OK. The issue with HBr, though, I have a nucleophilic bromide. Okay? And I'm going to generate a nucleophilic bromide regardless. But if I have a nucleophile now, what's the issue? It can quench the electrophile. It can quench our electrophile, which is kind of doing all within the same reaction, so it's a little bit weird. Okay? But I want something non-nucleophilic. Get used to that eraser hiding under there. So what would be a non-nucleophilic acidic hydrogen? H2SO4 would work. Okay. What's the problem with sulfuric acid? Very reactive. It tends to burn things. So while that would work, we want something that doesn't burn quite as badly. What's the name of that one? Acetic acid. Acetic acid and the presence of bromine now works out really well. We have a very electrophilic bromine because that acid helps polarize that bromine-bromine bond, and we get a decent electrophile out of that. If we want to really, really mess with the strength of that bond, we can switch to an entirely different catalyst. We could drop in a metal. What charge do our metals typically carry? Positives. Let's go through and throw on three more bromines. Now what happens? It's super positive. Okay, but our metal does not make very strong bonds with carbon structures. The bromine can donate its electrons in. We don't have another catalyst or another electrophile to compete, and we now have a good electrophile in our bromine. Okay. Both catalysts we looked at okay, generated or brought in some kind of positive. The iron tribromide 
works through a different result, or not a different result, but through a slightly different reaction than acetic acid. Okay? But these are both catalysts to the reaction. How would I name them? How could I classify them as a catalyst? What are they acting as? The bottom one should be straightforward and easy. An acid. What's the top one acting as? An electrophile, but that gets a little bit weird. It's also acting as an acid. It's acting as Lewis acid catalysts. The Lewis acid catalyst is going to make an electrophile more positive because the Lewis acid itself is drawing electrons away, generating a stronger electrophile. Okay. What kind of catalyst do you think we could add to the acyl chloride? What kind of acid could we add? How about a Lewis acid catalyst again? We're trying to do the exact same thing. We're trying to make the electrophile more electrophilic. We're adding another Lewis acid catalyst. Okay. HCl again becomes problematic. Okay. We could try and do sulfuric acid. Acyl chlorides are so reactive that you might get a minor reaction with the sulfate, even though the sulfate's very weak. So the catalyst we end up adding there, typically, is another metal catalyst, aluminum trichloride. How does <coughs> aluminum trichloride work as a metal catalyst? What is special about aluminum? It's not that small. What is its hybridization? SP2. What's left over? A P orbital. What could we put in that P orbital? Electrons from our chloride. Okay. Same way as the iron. The issue with the iron, though, is it's now pretty deep into your transition metals. And we're seeing the d orbitals become active and helping with that electron transfer. And how many of you want to look at the d orbitals within the last two weeks of the semester? Nope. Yeah. Okay. But it is doing something similar. Okay. So we're adding a catalyst just to polarize that bond okay, and generate a stronger electrophile. That's pretty much it. Make sense? Okay. So here are all of our reagents. Notice I switched it up on you. Instead of starting with bromine, I started with chlorine. Okay. We could add iron trichloride to elemental chlorine. That's going to do the same thing as adding iron tribromide to <coughs> elemental bromine. It's going to help us generate either a chlorine cation or a bromine cation for our electrophile. Yes? You could, it's aluminum chloride is typically tied to that, and I don't know the exact reasoning on why. But for starters, it's... The acyl chlorides are almost always with aluminum. Yeah. yeah. And if it, okay. And then if it's like the R2 or CO2, then you use the Fe, yeah. whatever. Typically Fe or iron, but it could be aluminum there too. Okay. We could also generate... At right, the very bottom, how do we generate that one? That one looks really weird. What's the electrophile in that one? Which atom is electrophilic? I'm trying to work on subtle hints. Why the carbon? <laughs> the one that's red, okay. Okay. We're highlighting our <laughs> electrophiles in red. Okay. Why can the oxygen not act as an electrophile? Mm, I don't accept too many bonds. If we draw out its official Lewis structure, 
Yes, it is positively charged. Can it accept more electrons? No. So by definition, it can't act as an electrophile. Why can it not accept more electrons? It's already got its octet. Okay? So really what we're looking at to predict something about the reactivity there is looking at a resonance structure where one of those pi bonds goes to the oxygen. What is the result? I get a positive charge on the carbon. There's my electrophile. Okay, so we have to be very careful when we look at our reactivity. It's not just saying, oh, there's a positive charge. That's the atom that's reacting. For instance, H3O plus acts as what? What's the reactive species? So, new question. What's the reactive species? In the purple one. Some people are laughing because they're getting the pattern. What did I just draw? The exact same thing. And yet, when it's formatted in this fashion, I'll typically get students telling me the oxygen's reactive. Okay? You memorized from general chemistry that the hydrogen was reactive in H3O+. We're now looking at a structure. You have to be careful when you interpret that structure. The hydrogen is still reactive in H3O+, even though the oxygen is the one that's charged, because the oxygen wants to accept its electrons, or take its electrons from hydrogen. That's what's generating the H+. Kind of make sense? So be a little bit weary, leery, leery. Be leery? I think that's right. Is that the right word? Be cautious around charged atoms. Make sure that you're actually identifying the atom that's going to react. Yes? Is this something we could see in the ACS? Yes. Okay. I personally like the last one the most. You guys might like it too because it has a fun name. It's actually kind of a silly name. You ready for it? It's, it's a, a silly name. It's a psyllium. <laughs> it's the psyllium ion. Okay. So you may see that pop up just because it's a fun <coughs> one. Okay. How could I possibly get an R positive? What is R typically? Carbon. So what we're asking is, how do I get a positive carbon? Huh? Okay, the acetylene could work, but then I'd be specifying all those extra pieces. And I'm not specifying all those extra pieces. I'm just saying, boom, positive carbon. What was that? Grignard gives you negative carbon. How do I get a positive carbon? Okay could go through and say, well, it's attached to bromine or chlorine, right? Is that a strong electrophile? No. Okay. We can't actually form the positive carbon because it's not stable. Okay. So I like where you're going with that, but it's not getting you to the answer. Change the structure so that you can get a positive carbon. What's that? Uh, you mean like the acylium ion? Good try, but no. We already did that. That's the acylium ion. Give me some other modification. You want a hint? Acetyl chloride takes you all the way back down to the acylium ion. This one doesn't work. This one works a little better. Why would this one work better? A tertiary carbocation. Okay, I could res not resonance, but an inductive stabilization of that carbon. So if I started with a tertiary structure, I could make that bromine leave on its easily on its own. Okay, if I went back to say the secondary, bromine's not going to leave super easily on its own. How could I help facilitate it and say, hey, come on, bromine, come on off? 
Is there, say, a catalyst that we could potentially add? How about a Lewis acid catalyst? That can help us form that carbocation. So we could start with just a standard alkyl halide and add a Lewis acid catalyst. That Lewis acid catalyst will help polarize it and generate our carbocation. Okay? Even ones that aren't particularly stable because the aluminum will do such a good job of stabilizing the leaving group. Okay? We can do the same thing with our acyl chlorides, okay, which is where you guys were jumping to already. Okay, we already saw how to make those. And we can form those catalysts at the end. Those last two are fairly famous. They were derived by two guys. I believe there were two guys, Friedel and Crafts. They get named after them. So they're referred to as Friedel Crafts reactions. Friedel Crafts alkylation and Friedel Crafts acylation. Which one's which? Alkylation for the top, because all we're adding is an alkyl group. For the bottom, it's the acylation, because what are we adding? We're adding an acyl group. Okay. As we'll find out later on, these reactions have varying conditions under which they work well and sometimes don't work very well at all. Okay. We've kind of already addressed that within the alkylation. What are the odds I can get the alkylation to work well with a primary alkyl halide? Not very good because primary carbocations aren't likely to form. Okay? So the alkylation does have some significant limitations because of that. I can't form that electrophile very easily. If the electrophile doesn't form, can the nucleophile attack? No. The acyl works a lot better because it is resonance stabilized as a final product. That resonance stabilization allows it to form. Once it forms, we can then have the aromatic ring attack. Okay? Kind of makes sense? Yes, Re. Does the acylation only happen when chlorine is attached to the carbonyl group or is it any sort of halide? Any kind of halide, you'll typically see it as chlorine, probably because of cost um, and maybe even toxicity. Okay. Um, the alkylation requires an active nucleophile. Do we know anything about changing our nucleophile yet? No. So that's kind of meaningless at this point. We'll have to see it again later. The acylation works a little bit nicer. It works with all rings. Why does it work with all rings? We can form the acylium ion. Sometimes we can't form the carbocation. Okay. So just some kind of limitations to keep in mind uh, when thinking a little bit further down the road. <coughs> um, so another limitation that could possibly pop up. What would we expect for the product here? have our benzene structure where we did the substitution for our, our electrophile, which is that carbon. We aren't touching the rest of that carbon chain, so we should end up with propyl benzene. Unfortunately, we don't get propyl benzene, and that has to do with what's happening with our Lewis acid catalyst. The whole point of the Lewis acid catalyst is to make a carbocation. What do we have to be concerned about with carbocations? Stability and any kind of rearrangement. So what ends up happening is we do form the primary carbocation. Not particularly stable, but once it forms, before it can react with the nucleophile, because our benzene rings are not very reactive species, we get a hydride shift forming the secondary carbocation, which then means by the time the nucleophile comes up and reacts, what I get is isopropyl benzene. Okay. So the Friedel 
Kraft's alkylation reagents tend to be limited in the length of their carbons that you're adding because if you add on too many carbons, or really more than two, you get rearrangements. Okay? Make sense? Um, what would we expect here? Okay, again, our first expectation is that we get the two phenyl rings attached to each other. <coughs> but remember, for that to happen, the first thing that has to occur is those must react with each other to form a carbocation. Can I form a benzene carbocation? No, which we saw in first semester looking at substitutions. That reaction can't happen. If that reaction can't happen, can I form the carbocation? Which means no electrophile. If there's no electrophile, no reaction, which... Okay, I didn't show you that. Okay. So we have to make sure that when looking at the friedel crafts alkylation that we kind of eliminate some of those side conditions that we've seen in the past. Okay. That's our first semester coming back to haunt us a little bit. Okay. Questions about that? Okay. How could I possibly generate the nitro? Okay. I need a positive nitrogen. This is an interesting one. Positive nitrogen with oxygens attached to it. Have I seen nitrogen with oxygens attached to it before? I think we've talked about it this semester. Any guesses? Does the silence mean no? No guesses? Yeah, no guesses. Also known as? Nitric acid. Okay. That's looking pretty close. In fact, I could even start to say, well, if I had those electrons shift over, I could then potentially kick that out, and I'd have the nitro. But what am I kicking out? Okay. A really bad leaving group, hydroxide. Well, hydroxide in a really bad environment isn't that big of a deal. It's hydroxide going into what kind of an environment? An acidic environment. I'm taking a strong base and dumping it to one of the most acidic environments ever. Mm, that's a really bad idea. Can't do that. Okay. So what has to happen before I can kick out that OH? It needs to be protonated. If I can get that protonated, what happens? Then I have a good leaving group in water. I've got a positive next to a positive, which is also highly unstable. This can kick, this can kick, and I would end up with my nitro. So all you would end up doing is sliding that hydrogen back and forth between those oxygens, which does nothing to the structure. Okay. Is that a possibility? Sure. But it does nothing to the structure. What does nitric acid act as? In this reaction, it's acting as an acid. It's donating hydrogen. Wait, what is nitric acid acting as? A base. Well, that's OK, because nitric acid isn't one of the strong acids that you were required to memorize in Gen Chem, right? Oh, wait. Yeah, nitric acid is a strong acid, which by definition dissociates into the acid components. And yet here, what's happening? It's not. How can I force a strong acid to not act like an acid, but to act like a base? React it with an even stronger acid. 
What is a stronger acid than nitric acid? H3O plus. Hydrochloric, unfortunately, no. H3O plus is actually significantly weaker by like 10,000 times. Sulfuric acid. If I mix nitric acid with sulfuric acid, the sulfuric acid is acidic enough that it will force a hydrogen onto the nitric acid structure. As soon as that hydrogen makes contact with nitric acid, it very quickly dissociates into water and our nitronium ion, our active electrophile. Okay. Tends to be a rather famous reaction to ask questions about because... Nitric acid is well acting as a base. It's very counter to what you were asked to memorize in general chemistry without actually grasping the concept of what's happening. Okay. Even our strong acids can be forced to act like bases if we put them in a stronger acid environment. Okay. In organic chemistry, we tend to kind of run into a limit here because... We use acids that are much stronger than sulfuric acid. It just destroys whatever the hell we're working with, so we tend not to use those or see those. Okay. But this gets us our active electrophile. We can now do the EAS reaction or react it with the benzene structure. Kind of make sense? Okay. How do I get this next electrophile? Where did I get the nitro from? Nitric acid reacting as a base with a stronger acid. Where might I get SO3? From SO4. What's a stronger acid than sulfuric acid? Well, it turns out in this case, really, sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid will react enough with itself to generate a very small concentration of this electrophile, which then means our benzene ring can react with it and we can attach <coughs> a sulfate to our benzene structure. Okay. That reaction becomes very, very powerful because sulfate or that SO3 structure does not want to exist. It wants to be with oxygens. So what is the lifetime of the sulfate actually attaching to the structure. It's actually a reversible reaction. Most of our other reactions are non-reversible. I can reverse the sulfate substitution. Okay? So it's pretty cool because of that. Last one. This should look really familiar. What does that one look like? What atom is the electrophile? Carbon. carbon. How do we abbreviate carbon electrophiles? R plus. Have I not seen R plus before? Friedel Crafts. So why am I adding this back on? There's another way. It's not just Friedel Crafts. In the Friedel Crafts, I just had R plus. Notice in this one, I've added a bunch of extra stuff. How else can I get a positive carbon? Believe it or not, yes. Sulfuric acid with what? What is sulfuric acid going to add? A hydrogen. So we need a source of electrons. So there's a theory. I didn't actually consider that one. That could work. We could do an OH. When we add the acid, what happens? Water turns into a great leaving group, potentially leaves. Try that again. Say that a little bit louder. What if we had an alkene? What's reactive? The pi bond, the pi electrons, can come out, react with the hydrogen from our sulfuric acid, leaving us with a carbocation. Okay. And we then have another electrophile that can potentially react forward with our benzene structures. Kind of make sense?
These get referred to as nitration, sulfonation, and alkylation, respectively. Um, just in case those names pop up, it can be something to be useful to be aware of. The next part of just our general reactivity, okay, uh, we've looked at allylic positions. Okay, so if we look at that top one, that carbon ends up being fairly reactive, okay, primarily because if I get rid of one of those hydrogens and formed a positive charge, what's special about it? Resonance, Resonance which means stable. What if I got rid of that hydrogen and instead made it a negative? Still resonant, stabilized. So the allylic position has lots of stabilization behind it. So the allylic position gets its own special name as allylic because of that resonance contribution. That changes its reactivity beyond that of just a standard alkane. We have a very similar location located in our aromatic rings, and that is the benzylic position. Why might the benzylic position be expected to react similarly to the allylic position? Whoops. Well, what happens if I erase most of the benzene ring? What do I now have? An allylic position. Okay. So the allylic and benzylic positions are very, very similar in their reactivity because they have lots and lots of resonance. This reactivity can be capitalized on in a variety of fashions. <clears throat> it becomes acidic. Okay, so I could react that with a base to form a carbocation. Okay, I could then potentially even have an alkyl halide and do a water substitution reaction relatively quickly and easily. Okay. Perhaps the most interesting, though, is this one. So if we ignore all the words and just focus on the reaction, what happened? I, substitution isn't a bad idea. I mean, what did you substitute? Mm. Oh, I see where you're going with that. Uh, unfortunately, not this carbon. And this carbon is the same. So the primary answer is an oxidation reaction. We don't typically classify it as a substitution because <coughs> substitution is looking at just the simple kind of exchange of electrons. We're not looking at an exchange here, we're looking at a full-on transferring of electrons. Okay. So it is an oxidation reaction. To do an oxidation reaction, what kind of reagent do I need to add? An oxidizer, like chromic acid. Chromic acid, okay. chromic acid will oxidize that very well. Are there other oxidizing agents that will do the same thing? PCC is an oxidizing agent, but what did that PC stand for? Politically correct, meaning it's weak, <laughs> not going to work. KMNO4 will also do the same job. Okay. So we can add the permanganate or chromic acid, and that will convert an alkyl chain into a carboxylic acid. Okay. Why might we want to do that? Couldn't we have just done a substitution of the carboxylic acid immediately onto the ring? That's an interesting idea. How could, else could I have made this? Okay, we'd have to go through a Grignard reagent, okay, which is arguably a lot less toxic because you aren't using a strong oxidizer. Okay. But maybe the Grignard reagent becomes a problem because you have an excessively strong nucleophile. Okay. So getting the carboxylic acid on there can be kind of circumvented if we start with benzene. Okay? If we start with just benzene, how could I get it on there? I could put on the alkyl chain first. Once the alkyl chain's on through a Friedel Crafts alkylation, I can just oxidize it. There's my benzoic acid. Okay? Um, there are limits to this reaction. Okay? For it to work, you must have at least one benzylic hydrogen. If you have one benzylic hydrogen, boom, benzoic acid. Okay? 
So it's a relatively quick one to memorize. Uh, when it comes to the mechanism, does anybody want to see the mechanism? I like the nose because I don't know the mechanism. Um, it'll just cleave off all those carbons into a bunch of other junk. Don't worry about what that junk is. You get benzoic acid. Okay, That's your focus. And with that, oh, let's take a look at this one. What do we expect here? We get no reaction because there's no benzylic hydrogen. We have hydrogens that are further out there. Those hydrogens are effectively alkanes. Alkane hydrogens don't do anything. It has to be the benzylic position. Okay? Oxidation of carbon side chains. So here we go. What do you guys think? What would our product be if we added permanganate to toluene? Benzoic acid, we have a benzylic hydrogen. How about an alkyl benzene? Technically, sec butyl benzene. You get benzoic acid. How about an alkenyl benzene? Benzoic acid. The alkynyl benzene. Ooh, that's interesting. We don't have that hydrogen. But we have the pi bond that's reactive enough that that will initiate this reaction. Same deal with the acyl benzene, which is why they all zero down into one box. And I tried to be misleading by giving that big line yeah. box. But it all spins down to one thing, the benzoic acid. So because there's electrons in the pi bond? It's those pi bonds that are providing electrons allowing this to occur, yes. Okay. <coughs> Uh, I believe so, but I'm not positive on that. Um, reduction of nitrobenzenes to aromatic amines. Okay, so that's interesting. What's happening? We shown how to get nitrogen attached to the structure? What do you mean, yes? A nitro, we've shown how to get on to the ring. That's probably why you need the reduction of nitro. We do not have a way of getting an amine. Okay? Or, for those of you that were here on Wednesday or watched the video very carefully, the structure known as... Uh, it was actually pretty good. Aniline. Yeah. We don't have a way to add NH2 to the benzene ring. It's not going to happen. Okay. Any ideas why? What does the nitrogen have to act as? An electrophile. In the case of the NO2, what's special about the oxygens? They are electron withdrawing, making the nitrogen positive, making it an electrophile. What's the issue with the anilines. We'd have hydrogens and the relationship between hydrogen and nitrogen. Is the hydrogen would be putting up um, MH2 if anything, up. hydrogen's donating electrons to the nitrogen, making <coughs> the nitrogen more nucleophilic, not electrophilic. So we cannot directly add NH2. We have to go through an intermediate step, and that's taking it to the nitro functionality. Once we now have the nitrogen attached, how do we get rid of the oxygens? How do we decrease oxygen bonds and add hydrogen bonds? We need to do a reduction. Okay. What reduction or reducing agents are we aware of? H2 and a metal. Okay. You can throw in radium nickel, you can throw in platinum, palladium, all of those. Okay. All of those will work out fairly well and do that reduction. Okay. Within this chapter, we end up adding a new one. Okay which I personally find very, very irritating. A dissolved metal reduction, HCl and iron, or zinc, or tin, or a half a dozen different metals. So worry less about the exact identity of that metal. 
but HCl in the presence of a metal is very, very common for some type of reduction. Okay. Good question. Why do we not reduce the ring? It's too stable. Okay. It can't reduce any one of those individually because then it goes up in energy. You would have to reduce all of them simultaneously, which it can't do. Okay. So to do the reduction of the ring, we need a much more active reducing agent, which we do have. It's just not this one. Um, Sandmeyer is kind of a neat reaction. Um, I don't remember if I have actually drawn out the mechanism. I don't think I drew out the mechanism. Um, but once we have the amine, you can react that with sodium nitrite in the presence of an acid. That will then generate a very interesting structure, which will react in the presence of a copper nucleophile or nucleophilic reagent and do a substitution directly off the ring. Okay. For that to happen though, we have to have an exceptionally good leaving group. So that then begs the question, what is our leaving group? What is the leaving group generated at the end of step one? Well, what's the reactivity that you see up in those structures? What's that? Carbon. Okay, we could look at the carbon. Which carbon is reactive? Uh, How is it reactive? Okay, so you're suggesting a substitution. If it was a direct substitution, why do I need step one? What is step one doing? It's changing this structure out here. We need to turn that into a leaving group. So what you need to do is focus on the reagents provided and see what you can come up with. Talk to the people around you. I'm just interested to see what you can work through. I'll even be nice and draw this out. Oh, shoot. This one's a little bit harder. But I'll be nice and draw the Lewis structure for the nit nitrite. Okay. We could attempt to do resonance, but now what happens? You would exceed the octet on the nitrogen. It's not even the nitrogen's positive. And we'd have the exact same structure. So it's not a bad idea to look at that, but that doesn't do anything productive. So where else can those electrons go? Our only real choice is to the hydrogen. Okay, so now what do we have? We've now neutralized that reaction or that charge. So now what? You want a hint? What if I draw on this? The carbon's positive. Why is the carbon positive? Because this is a polar pi bond. What do we have in the nitrous acid? A polar pi bond. Which atom is positive? Why the nitrogen? It's less electronegative than the oxygen. The lone pairs from our anil and nitrogen can come in and attack. And this is really what's going to start the cascade of a nightmare of a mechanism, which hopefully I stopped you early enough from getting too far into because it was not my intent to make you go that far down a rabbit hole. Just a little bit, at least to where the clock started.
we now have a negative oxygen. And a positive, no we don't. Oh, sorry, yes. What can we do? We could lose a hydrogen. I'm going to accept that and not draw it. Okay, we can gain a hydrogen there also. Accept that and not draw it. So this one's neutral. Now we run to this question of stable. This would be the equivalent of... our tetrahedral intermediate back in our carbonyl chemistry. And what happened with that? We reform our pi bond by kicking out a leaving group. So we need to reform our pi bond. Where's our pi bond going to reform? Oxygen and the nitrogen. Why? Why between the two nitrogens and not between the two oxygens? Nitrogen is less electronegative, so it's going to donate electrons more readily than the oxygen. That's what I would run with. Say the nitrogen is going to be better at donating electrons in because it's less electronegative than oxygen. So it should share electrons making a polar pi bond. Okay? We will end up into a semantic argument, because I'm going to guess that's not what the textbook drew, Jen. Yeah. You're going to get into a semantic arg argument on where that polar pi bond forms first. Is it an argument that's worth fighting over? No. Okay. Is it worth mentioning that probably the nitrogen's better? Yeah, I think so. Okay. But what would happen now if that nitrogen shared its electrons in? I would exceed the octet, and I can't do that. I'd have to kick out a leaving group. But what are my leaving groups? OH. And I can't do that because I'm in an acidic solution. So what has to happen first? I need to protonate. So I now have a positive oxygen. Now the electrons can come in, kick out that leaving group, and now what do I have? So I can remove that hydrogen. Okay, so this is interesting. That's neutral. Why are you suggesting that we continue to protonate? Because if I protonate, now what happens? I have a charged structure again. And then you're saying to do this? Yeah. Why would I do that? Well, being stuck at the double bond, we are trying to create a good leaving group, right? It's kind of that last step is what's driving it, though. You have a lot of reversibility. We do get a lot of reversibility through that. What's also happened at this point? Nitrogen could take those electrons away, and I now have nitrogen gas, which is a really good leaving group. That's where the second step of this reaction comes into play and I end up adding the copper with whatever my nucleophile is. Okay. So the, the uh, BR that's already in solution from the HBR wouldn't... Isn't good enough. You need the copper reagent. You have to have the copper there. Yep. So we get a variety of reagents that can come out of this. We need pretty much a nucleophile connected to copper. Look at all those reagents. Almost all of them are set up using some kind of copper reagent. There are a few kind of exceptions, but for the most part, we generated a super uh, reactive structure in the benzene diazonium because that nitrogen is dying to get kicked off the structure. Okay. So it can get replaced very quickly as long as copper catalyzes the formation of that carbocation because benzene doesn't form carbocations. Okay. The copper must be there for that. It must be catalyzed in some fashion. And so that's what those other reagents are. Kind of makes sense? Okay. I know it's an exciting one. Everybody loves that one. It's known as your Sandmeyer reactions. 
there's a big long mechanism which continues. Remember each of those hydrogens I erased and, and moved? Those are each a mechanistic step. So again, our summary. Very rarely are you ever expected to know these. It's more just pull from your reagent list. Okay. Questions? Okay. There's our summary of nearly everything. What's missing? The Sandmeyer reactions aren't listed on that because they take up a lot of space. So I don't have all those listed out. The ones that you're primarily concerned about are the ones in red and the ones in blue underneath. Okay. Those are the big ones. We have to watch out for some acid-base chemistry that can get in the way. And we also have to watch out for substituent conversions, particularly when looking at the alkylation and acylations. We can get all sorts of weird stuff happening within those. Okay? Questions? Okay. I thought I had practice in there. Oh, there's practice. So, because, yeah, this is exactly where I wanted to end, which works out pretty well. So we'll start this as a quiz on Wednesday. Pick any, because you get two days to do it, we'll give you two of those. Pick any two, one, two, three, or four. Okay. Assume all of them occur once. Okay. And we'll talk about what that means in the next section. Okay. So if you read ahead, that's okay. Just realize you're still making all of these occur once. Then follow your EAS chemistry. So follow the mechanisms that we've just talked about. Okay. Do those reactions. Decide on a product. It does not have to be the correct product, but decide on a product. Draw the intermediate structure. Okay, so that was the sigma structures. And I want all of those resonance structures. Okay. What we will do on Wednesday is you will then compare your answers to your classmates. So at this point, I really don't want you to read ahead because I actually want at least a few people to write the wrong answer because we need those wrong answers to compare with. So what we'll start with on Wednesday is we've got four boards. Yeah, front, back, side, side. I want, what's that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, believe it or not, let's see. Let's see if we can figure this out. So the first one, odds are you will give me the correct answer. Uh, second one, odds are you'll give me the correct answer. Third one, odds are you'll give me the wrong answer. And the fourth one, odds are you'll give me the wrong answer. Um, the fourth one's actually super obnoxious. It's like doubly sure that you're going to give me the wrong answer. <coughs> so, four boards. I want right and wrong answers to questions one and two. Okay? That's where we pick up Wednesday. Question one and question two with four possible structures. Okay. So, if you guys don't do them all, I will give you right and wrong answers 